Okay, um, I'd just like to say welcome to everybody. My, my name is um, Liz Curtis. I'm a lecturer in primary education at the University of Aberdeen. Um, one part of my remit, I work in a, as an environmental educator and I have an interest in place-based um, experiential learning um, in educational and family settings and looking at temporal and ecological perspectives of that. Um, as you'll be aware over the course of the day, well, the last today, and those of you who participated last week, this is part of a series of events as part of the Scotland's contribution to research on the changing Arctic. Um, and it's we're hoping that that this um, network events will facilitate facilitate collaboration and coordination amongst um, Scottish higher education institutions and um, similar institutions um, in, in the Arctic through particularly the U University of Arctic Network. Um, we've got um, four speakers today um, and hopefully what we'll, what we'll be doing is over the course of the four presentations we'll be looking and exploring key drivers and engaging young people from school through higher education and into the workplace um, and basically life practices in the future. All of the speakers in this session will highlight the importance of experiential learning through the context of gardening, marine biology, civil engineering and then um, we'll be also be um, given the opportunity to find out or to explore what the Lyra Institute's doing in terms of pulling together circumpolar studies across the Arctic. The first, first speaker, Professor, Don, Professor Donald Gray, will also highlight the role of activist education and why supporting young people in school to find their political voices matters. The second and third speakers, Dr Jordan Grigger and Professor Bob Gilmore, will highlight how the role of learning in real life contexts in higher education in the European Arctic develop key knowledge and transferable skills which promote employability in relation to the renewable energy sector and marine ecologies. And there, our fourth speaker, speaker Doc, Dr Anthony Spector, will address the, um, say, will address the role of the Lyra Institute. Together, the four presentations hopefully will demonstrate the interconnectedness of a range of disciplinary approaches, reciprocity of knowledge between learners and teachers, and an active voice which underpins what is needed to be environmentally educated and the possible future impact of this education. So I'd like um, to introduce our first speaker, Professor Donald Gray, who is at the School of Education at the University of Aberdeen. Um, Donald Gray has a long experience um, in the context of um, environmental education and science and sustainability education. Um, he's a long-standing interest in outdoor learning and the theoretical perspectives that underpin the value of this, with particular reference to embodied cognition and activism. He is currently involved in a range of projects relating to food growing and food activism in, it, in educational contexts. So I'd like to hand over to Donald, who's going to speak to us for around eight minutes, um, outlining current research in Scotland um, and within the Scottish policy landscape for learning for sustainability. Donald. Donald, we can't hear you just now. We need to unmute. Here we are. Sorry, I was just trying to, uh, I've lost all the, here we are. Uh, I'm trying to get my screen up. That's it. Can you hear me now? Yeah, loud and clear, and we can see your slides fine too. Thank you. Okay, right. I'm going to try and get through this in uh, eight minutes. I'm sorry, I might just overrun by a minute, but I'm going to talk about environmental education in Scotland. Um, and this really is a very brief history of environmental education in Scotland. Then, then the second half will be about my current projects and, and what I'm working on at the moment. Um, and then a, a, a tentative suggestion about where I'm headed with, the, with this. So um, 
I mean, Scotland has got a reasonable history in uh, environmental education, um, starting in the 1970s, really, with uh, um, a guy called uh, Professor John Smith, or Smythe, I'm never sure how you pronounce his name, um, but um, he's been quite prominent. Um, and uh, but in 1974, the HMI, the Her Majesty Inspectorate, uh, published a report on environmental education. A few years later, the Scottish Ed Environmental Education Consortium was founded. Um, with people like Kate Sankey and John Smith, Smythe. Um, but that wound up in 2000. And as uh, Alistair Lavery and so on, uh, and John Smythe um, point out, uh, after 1994, the term used in most official documents became education for sustainability. Um, more recently, um, the Learning for Sustainability Scotland was established, and we really use the term learning for sustainability now. So it's gone from environmental education to uh, education for sustainable development to learning for sustainability. Um, and that's really happened over a period of time uh, in the past 10, 15 years, uh, starting with the, the decade of um, Education for Sustainable Development, where Scott, the Scottish Government published Learning for Our Future. I mean, I'm going to rattle through these because there's too much to say in eight minutes. Um, that was followed by the second half, which was uh, Learning for Change, um, which had a, a, a number of suggestions, and they developed a Sustainable Development Education Advisory Group. Um, more recently, and this is, these are the ones which are more pertinent to today, um, Learning for Sustainability uh, was published in March 2013. It was driven by uh, Professor Pete Higgins at Edinburgh University. And this, the report of the One Planet Schools Working Group suggest, said that every learner should receive their entitlement to learning for sustainability and every practitioner should demonstrate learning for sustainability in their practice. Um, the uh, Learning for Sustainability Scotland is a United Nations recognised uh, regional centre of expertise um, and it's based in Edinburgh, it's housed by Edinburgh University um, and um, they are, they are kind of the key cornerstone of Learning for Sustainability in Scotland at the moment. Um, but following on from the Learning for Sustainability um, uh, One Planet Schools report, more recently, 2016, the Vision 2030 plus report was uh, produced. And again, it just takes this further forward about promoting awareness of learning for sustainability as a concept and, and driving this forward. Um, the strategic object objectives have been accepted by the Scottish Government, uh, and uh, these are worth emphasising that all learners should have an entitlement to learning for sustainability. And in line with the GTCS professional standards, which have got learning for sustainability as a core principle within the standards for teacher registration. Every practitioner, school and education leader should demonstrate learning for sustainability in their practice. Every school should have a whole school approach to learning for sustainability. All school buildings, grounds and policies should support learning for sustainability and a strategic national approach to supporting for learning for sustainability should be established. Um, very recently, the Scottish Government uh, produced their action plan for learning for sustainability, um, which really uh, is addressing the recommendations of the Vision 2030 report. Um, what I would say with this is there's a lot on paper. Let's say there's a lot on paper, a lot of policy directives and a lot of um, in principle support for learning for sustainability. What I would like to see is a little bit more practical action. Um, what that practical action uh, takes the form of still has to be um, uh, decided and looked at and taken forward. Um, I'm just going to uh, look at some of the initiatives that I'm involved in. I'm, I've got three minutes left to talk about this. Um, I've been working for a couple of years on a, on, on a garden project with uh, uh, an organisation called One Seed Forward in Aberdeen. Um, and we, uh, one is a nutritional and healthy health and well-being aspect, but we are also linking in with the importance of soil for uh, climate, climate change and biodiversity and so on. So the, the, the One Seed Garden Schools project is, um, is ongoing and it's, and it's actually growing um, and it's got a very small number of people involved in it at the moment. Uh, so we're, we are having to try and 
uh, build up capacity for taking this forward and developing uh, garden schools. There is a website uh, which we've just developed, which has got all our resources and all the, uh, a few videos in there as well. Uh, and it's aimed at teachers and student teachers to take forward the principles of environmental education or learning for sustainability through gardens. And it also links in with the health and well-being aspects. Uh, building on that, uh, Laura Colucci Gray, my wife, who was also part of the original team, uh, drove forward with Claire Cassidy from University of Strathclyde, a Scottish University's Insight Institute uh, initiative, which is just completing, we're just writing up the report just now, um, and we have produced um, a learning for sustainability framework, uh, which uh, is, is built on principles of social justice, inquiry and learning, and we are linking that with a food activist framework, which um, if I just look at my notes here, uh, it consists of food quality, food production disposal, um, food access and distribution or food equity, food sovereignty, and food sustainability. So five uh, dimensions of uh, food, uh, food sustainability, uh, food activism. So we're developing this food activism, um, uh, empowering young people and teachers to take forward ideas in, around uh, food growing in schools. Um, and in the last minute, I'll just mention uh, Another aspect of things, uh, a more conventional study I did a few years ago, and which is still ongoing, uh, is looking at the impact of nature uh, on uh, children and young people's mental well-being. And essentially, I did a survey of undergraduate students, which showed that those who had particular experiences in natural environments when they were young, children, usually uh, pr uh, primary school age children, um, would have a better sense of mental well-being based on the Warwick Edinburgh mental well-being scale. So uh, natural environments, I mean, there's nothing particularly new. I mean, we know that natural environments have got a very positive impact on uh, health and well-being. And what I want to do is to take that forward a little bit more and explore that further. Um, and at the moment, uh, what I'm about to do, I've spoken to a number of uh, colleagues within the, the school and um, I'm looking to develop a research group which looks at the impact of natural environments on children and young people. Um, and we have a counselling and uh, educational psychology unit in the School of Education, which uh, uh, will also be involved in looking at this, uh, the impact of natural environments on in learning, well-being and environmental identity and behaviours. And that is basically the end of my presentation. I think I did it in eight and a half minutes, so it's not bad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Donald. Um, so th this, this is a kind of starting on a journey of kind of the idea of environmental education as something that is a lifelong endeavour. It's not just something that you do at particular stages, but hopefully one that starts in the early years of school and carries forward throughout throughout life. So we're now now moving from soil to sea. And I'd like to invite um, Dr. Jordan Grigger from the University of Highlands and Islands, their, uh, from their Scottish Marine, Marine uh, so Scottish Association for Marine, Marine Sciences, who um, is a postdoctoral researcher and marine biologist. And he's going to be talking about opportunities that have been made available for undergraduate students to study science in the European Arctic um, within real life context. And I'll just pass on to Jordan. Thank you. Hiya. Hey, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Great. Okay, then I'm just going to share the screen. And then put the presentation on. Yep, we can see that. Great. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk at this great session. Scotland has a real interest in the High North, which is evident from its presence at so many international research meetings and groups. Um, the publication of the Scotland's Arctic Policy Framework and all the hard work that Scotland's researchers are doing in the High North. My name is Jordan Grigger. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Scottish Association for Marine Science and a marine biologist. And today I'm going to talk to you about a unique and fantastic opportunity that was given to me 
to pursue Arctic science and is now available to a large number of Scottish students. So I'm sure that we all agree that the Arctic is an incredible, spectacular environment. By going to the Arctic, you get to see interesting things like the polar night, the midnight sun, polar bears, seals, foxes. And the Arctic is a region that's rapidly changing. In fact, due to global warming, it's warming three times faster than anywhere else on the planet. In the Arctic Ocean, the animals that live there are changing their behaviors and their distribution. And consequently, it's so important to study them to learn about the changes that are occurring. And that's something I've been able to do for the last decade. So I'm a planktonologist, and what that means is I study the animals that can't really swim too much in the sea. And that's a lot of animals. And I've did that in several countries now. Most of it involves microscope work. And in my PhD, which was in Canada, in Quebec, I studied arrow worms. And at the end of it, I kind of turned into an arrow worm because of how many I looked at. But a big part of my interests are educating the next generation of scientists. And the young people really care about the Arctic because they probably watch programs by David Attenborough and others that really encourage that from a young age. They love hands-on research where they get to touch the plankton and be part of the process. That's something I was able to even do in landlocked states in America. And I lived in Tennessee for two years using aquariums to teach high school kids about the ocean. And that was a good opportunity to put Scotland on the international scene. And that's something I'll come back again to later. What this says is really a tale of two institutions. The first one being the Scottish Association for Marine Science. That's one of 13 partners of the University of the Highlands and Islands. It's a great place to study marine science because it's right by the edge of the sea in Oban. And consequently, you get a real exposure to the oceans that you might not get in other places. I studied here between 2006 and 2010, and I graduated with a unique degree called Marine Science with Arctic Studies. The second institution I'm gonna talk about is the University Center in Svalbard, and that's the world's northernmost higher education establishment. So Eunice and SAMS have forged a great relationship over the last decade, and this allows students from SAMS to study at Eunice, alongside the polar bears, and the reindeers. How this works is that during the third year of the four year bachelors at SAMS, you can spend either a full or half year living and studying in Svalbard. When you come back, you must complete an Arctic themed dissertation and a case study. And then consequently, you'll graduate with a special degree, which is called Marine Science with Arctic Studies. I was the first student to do this. Since then, many students from SAMS have taken advantage of this. In 2017, there was nine students from SAMS doing this. Getting accepted to UNIS depends on, you know, it's, it's, it's probably slightly competitive, um, but there's a, an ability to study several different types of science. You can study technology, biology, geology, or geophysics. And this is the area that we're talking about. It's in Svalbard. UNIS has a mission to provide university level, level education in Arctic studies with 50 university level courses at the bachelor and master's level. As I mentioned, you can study biology, geology, geophysics and technology, and its researchers are publishing actively in all of these fields. UNIS is used then as a natural environment and Svalbard's natural environment um, for assessing the changes that are happening in the Arctic. And there is an emphasis on fieldwork, just like there is at SAMS. Apart from in this case, you're doing it in the Arctic and you're using boats and snowmobiles to travel to your field site. Then you're contributing to the development of Svalbard as an international research base. And what's important here is that there is a very heavy uh, focus on taking students from different countries and creating an international community. Some of that community is shown here, walking through the streets of Longyearbyen, which is the capital city in Svalbard. 
And I had so many great memories walking through that town, um, living a great life, actually, because it has everything you need for a very good life. Um, a lot of the students, 50% are international and they enjoy outdoor activities and uh, parties as well. That was an important part of it. There's a focus on diversity, 55% of the student population being women. On the left here, we have uh, Victoria. And on the right, we have Sally. These are two students from SAMS. And both of them went on to do masters. Victoria works in the Red Sea scuba diving. So that's very important. The Arctic students, Arctic study students have went on to do fantastic things. Many of them uh, at graduate schools. Many of them have continued to live on Svalbard. And what we're doing in that case is we're putting Scotland on an international map. And we're, we're engaging our scientists, our students in science on the international level. Unfortunately, the loss of Erasmus is a big hit to allow for diversity and inclusion in the Arctic stream. That's one of the downsides of Brexit. But we are hoping that students will continue to be funded by other sources. And even when I went, we did have money from Erasmus, but we had money from trusts and also from personal funding. That's something you need to think about when you go to Svalbard. I'm just going to go back to my area of expertise, which is zooplankton. There are so many species of animals that live in the Arctic that very few people even know about. And um, some of them are shown here. I was able to publish papers on these animals thanks to that opportunity that I got in Svalbard. Um, and it really opened up my career. And I'm sure it will for other people too. Such as all these students who went to Svalbard. And uh, here's photos of them standing in front of the same sign in Norway, which says, welcome to Svalbard. So yeah, that's the end of my talk. I just wanted to give you an introduction to this opportunity. Thanks for listening. Thank, thank you very, thank you very much, um, Jordan, um, which has given us a, a, a very nice overview of the work that's been going on between um, the University of Svalbard and um, UHI in relation to joint student projects and, and learning in different contexts, which is a really nice segue into our next speaker, Professor Bob Gilmore, um, who is also going to be addressing some of the um, issues around um, employability and, tra and um, tran transversal skills, which grow out of thinking about an interdisciplinary and inter intercultural learning um, within um, real life context and um, in in the um, this is in the in relation to renewables, which again is a, I suppose a very a very um, important part of thinking about um, research related to envi environment in the Arctic and and in the post post oil economies. So, Professor um, Bob Gilmore, welcome. Thanks very much, Liz. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be uh, talking to you guys today. I think it's a fascinating opportunity for showcasing some of the key, really exciting environmental sustainability initiatives that we have and are links with the Scotland Arctic environment. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, an Erasmus Plus strategic partnership. So I, uh, I'm very much like George and I'm very disappointed that the funding has gone through Erasmus at the present time. Let's see how the touring scheme uh, comes forward. But what I'm going to do in the next eight minutes or so is I'll, I'll explain to you what this strategic partnership PEATS is. I'll outline why it developed. I'll outline how it developed and then I'll give you some examples of the different types of learning and it is very much an interdisciplinary uh, multicultural learning activity uh, providing some experiential types of, of learning and then we'll, we'll focus finally on the impacts of, of the initiative. So I'm assuming that you can all hear me okay and you can see my screen okay if I can get a thumbs up from uh, some of the other speakers great thank you very much. Okay, and the screen doesn't want to move forward. That might be it now, yeah. So Pete's Promoting Excellence in Employability and Transversal Skills. It was a three-year European Erasmus strategic partnership. It was industry-informed and we're focused on employability skills, the development of them through a range of different types of disciplines. Uh, so with different disciplines from civil engineers, environmental management, marketing, business, energy management, a whole range of different types of 
students that would be working together in perhaps some of the, the future renewable energy initiatives. Uh, there were a whole range of different cultures. We had students and staff from the three main partners, Scotland, Finland, and the Netherlands. And you can see at the bottom here, uh, some of the, uh, the icons and the, the logos of, of the different partners, the Hague University, Lahti University in Finland, Construction Area in Scotland, who were our industry partner, and where I come from, Glasgow Caledonian University. One of the key elements of the learning took part in a, a 10 day intensive study period where we took up to 80 students, sorry, up to 50 students and staff to Scotland uh, in the first year, Finland the next year, and then the Netherlands in the final year. So this was all funded by uh, the European Union. Why did it develop? Well, it developed primarily because it was a range of very unique, I guess, individuals from each of these partners who had links to each other. And it's about trying to identify where your networks might come from and maybe the skill sets that each of the partners would have. And you might be able to see that Tim from Netherlands was involved in uh, marketing, so was Jan Tien, but also intercultural awareness and analysis. Dale from industry had the experiential and industrial perspective. Yuha from uh, Latte was technology. Jay Sari was international communication, Caroline a bit more about student well-being and environmental management, and I was the sort of uh, coordinator of it. But I guess we didn't understand or we really underestimated the, the full extent of the skill sets that we had at our disposal. We didn't know it at the start, but these really developed throughout the three to four years of our initiative. And it didn't uh, develop automatically and it developed over the three year period. And this is, uh, I'm not sure if you can make it, there's far too much detail included within this. This is our annual implementation uh, cycle, which highlights the key learning, whether it's project management activities, whether it's uh, intellectual outputs or activities, or whether it's learning and teaching and training activities. So you can see it's actually a pretty full timetable that we have throughout the year. But most of the learning for both the students and the staff uh, took place at the start during the induction in January and February, going through some additional uh, online activities that the students took part with and then culminating in a 10 day intensive study period. But it was continuous enhancement. And I think that's one of the key things about these activities. Sometimes, again, you don't realise how uh, the skill sets that are at your disposal and how these can develop. So the types of activities that we took part in, we took them in the first year to the Hollow Mountain in Scotland, uh, in uh, Loch Awe, uh, Crook and Hydroelectric Pump Storage Scheme. Uh, then we, we, we took them also to SAMS and SAMS provided an open, SAMS provided uh, an outline of environmental impacts associated with development of uh, wind turbines in the marine environment. We had a three day period where the students actually got together and built uh, working wind turbines. So this is really quite important. It's pushing them out with their comfort zone. It's not a type of activity you would normally have within a classroom. So you've got the students from environmental management, marketing and business saying, how on earth are we going to be able to build these wind turbines? And indeed, they're, they're pouring the concrete and uh, into the foundations here. And we created three different turbines producing electricity. We also had cultural activities with a Kaylee. Uh, we also had uh, sharing of food, and this is at the campfire in Finland, smoking salmon, cooking salmon beside the campfire. And there was also in, in The Hague, we had a different sort of activity for or, or different focus for each of the different uh, uh, areas that we, we, we went to. And this was about taking the the Hague off the gas grid and going for more renewable types of activities. And obviously there were lots of different activities for the students to develop their presentational skills, as well as their cultural and knowledge-based skills at the same time. But we didn't think that was enough because we wanted to introduce some unexpected challenges. It wasn't just so much as changing the goalposts, it was also about changing the game. And that helps the students understand about resilience and development of resilience. So, for example, we gave them a team report 
to prepare. And it was a business report that was supposed to be pre presented at uh, nine o'clock on our Friday morning. We, we told them that unfortunately the, the, the rules have changed. You're going to have to bring forward your development of that presentation by 12 hours. And of course, that meant that they were really upset about it. But looking back on it and the feedback from the students was that it was one of the most important learning activities that they had during the time. Now it's not just the case that the students have got to be challenged as well, I think staff have also got to be challenged and indeed maybe our challenge wasn't so much climbing out of the frozen lake, this is me in Finland in the frozen lake, it was actually me getting into the frozen lake because if you're like me and you're over 50 you think uh-uh, I could have a heart attack going in there. But I didn't want to lose face with my uh, colleagues from Finland and I wanted to test myself and prove myself. And indeed, actually, it was, again, a very worthwhile, rewarding initiative just for myself there. And that's the sort of thing that we wanted to do. We wanted to introduce these challenges to, that would push people out with their, their comfort zone. Some of the key outputs and uh, outcomes from uh, Pete's, and these are these were tested statistically uh, for the students, and it was about the enhancement of attributes and skills, self confidence, leadership, communication, coping with stressful situations. The, the very fact that we had fourteen different nationalities, different cultures, different. Uh, Different disciplines coming together meant it was very challenging for them. Uh, and some of the comments, students, the best experience I've ever had. Now, I did have to question that because I'm thinking, how could they not have a, a better experience in elsewhere in life? But maybe maybe that's exactly the case they had. Uh, and indeed, one of the students we had in the second year, we got the students to come back as mentors and share their experience with uh, the other students. And they presented the, the impacts to their other colleagues as well. So just penultimate slide, a lot of detail in this, but I prepared this slide to demonstrate where the rich value and impact of all of these activities came together. Very quickly, it was about producing the transferable outputs and outcomes, whether it's a five credit module, an app that we developed that would benchmark students' intercultural competence and assess it along with the 14 different nationalities. It was about enhancing student expertise, developing their professionalism and skills and their technical capabilities. It was also about uh, improving the performance. And of course, we're not claiming that the whole PEATS project was the sole cause of improving the performance, but they did, 85% uh, of the students were gaining a more than a 2-1 uh, in, in their grades, and most of them are now employed. But the thing that we uh, underestimated was enhancing the staff expertise and professionalism, enhancing professional qualifications, the number of publications and uh, presentations we gained from this. Indeed, further grant applications, we got another 300,000 from uh, Erasmus Plus for it as well. But the one on the left, I think, is really important in terms of demonstrating impact for your organisation, enhancing the institutional facilities and reputations, where you're improving the KPIs, whether it's income, international mobility, employability, teaching excellence, or the NSS, funding for new equipment, and then the one that the principal seemed to like, surprisingly enough, performance and major awards. We were shortlisted for the Scottish Green Energy Awards, uh, the only university, I think, that were uh, well, the only one of two Scottish universities speaking at Going Global, and then the one that really I think is the key one, the Collaborative Award for Teaching Excellence uh, in 2019. One of the first two in Scotland to be awarded such a prestigious, for those of you who are not aware of it, the most prestigious teaching and learning award in the UK, demonstrating collaboration at its, uh, at its forefront. So in summary, our team created a variety of flexible, innovative and award-winning learning environments that developed and enhanced the skills and attributes for not just the students, but also the staff as well. Uh, and, and I guess you can probably sense from my, uh, my enthusiasm, we had an awful lot of fun. We've developed uh, lifelong friendships that we hope are going to spin off into further projects. And I think this is maybe one of the key things here, the rich value and impact of these initiatives can be so much greater than you initially plan or you could wish for. And there's my contact details if anyone's interested in, in, in meeting with me or speaking with me later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, very much as well. Um, say, followed on very well from the previous speaker in terms of thinking about the, the value that's added in a very broad range of ways when you collaborate with other institutions and also, as I say, taking learning into 
real life context. Our final speaker um, in this session is Dr. Anthony Spicker, who's um, the Managing Director of the University of Arctic's um, Lyra Institute. Um, and I'm actually just going to pass over to Anthony and you can tell us about the work that you're doing there in, in looking across polar regions. Um, thank you. Anthony, you're still muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. I thought I had unmuted myself, but I must not have pressed the button correctly. Yeah, fine now. Okay, and thank Good. you. Um, it's nice to be here. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak here. It's delightful to, to talk with all of you about the Lyra Institute. I was invited here as a representative of, of the Lyra Institute, um, the U-Arctic, to speak with you about this initiative that um, I'm, I'm collaborating on with a number of my colleagues. So I just want to give you a, um, an overview of what it is that we're doing and hope that's of interest to you. Now, um, many of you are come from universities that are U-Arctic members, some of you may not, but um, just as a background on the U-Arctic, it was founded in, in, in 2001 to promote circumpolar collaboration. Um, it has members from um, all of the uh, circumpolar countries, the countries of the territory um, in the Arctic, plus a number of members from non-Arctic countries, including the UK. And so the mission um, is to provide educational and research opportunities to the people of the circumpolar north. And it's the educational part of those opportunities that the Lyra Institute is particularly focused on. Um, UArctic has been involved in educational output since the very beginning. Um, UArctic, early on, one of the first projects of UArctic was to create um, a circumpolar studies program as a kind of an undergraduate core curriculum that all members could use and included uh, seven seven modules, as you call them, um, in the UK or courses if you're coming from outside the UK in North America. Um, those seven are listed on the right. Um, and they're, they were sort of off the shelf courses that were meant to be, um, that could be used by faculty from any UArctic institution to teach circumpolar studies. Um, they've gone through um, an update, one or two updates since being, um, being first written. And they're still in use, the Circumpolar Studies Program. It was originally called the Bachelor of Circumpolar Studies Program, now called the UArctic Circumpolar Studies Program. And there are uh, some institutions that are still using these courses. Um, so for example, Trent University, the university with which I'm affiliated in Canada, um, uh, manages a kind of a North American consortium of universities that are teaching these courses and they trade off who's teaching them um, and the, the courses themselves are taught online often, so they're open to um, UR students from UArctic member institutions all around the world. So Trent will often have students from uh, universities in, in Russia or in Japan or Europe or other places taking um, the courses that are being uh, delivered by Trent faculty and then vice versa. So they're, and they're also um, being used by universities in Europe like Nord University and in Russia like um, NARFU, for example. Um, probably tens of thousands of students um, have, over the past 18 years, have passed through one or more of these courses and benefited from what the UArctic, what UArctic has to offer. Now, um, recently, as a kind of a development on that, a number of members of the UArctic, um, seen here, have come together to establish the Lyra Institute. Lyra is the Icelandic word for to learn or to study. And the purpose of the Lyra Institute is to renew and to revitalize this circumpolar studies offering. So the seven universities here are uh, the, the steering committee for Lyra, but all UArctic member institutions are welcome to engage with our work. And, and what is our work? Well, our work, when I say to renew and to revitalize circumpolar studies, what we intend to do is not to, not to update these courses um, or modules, but rather um, develop a kind of topic specifications. All of you, um, a lot of you here will be from the UK. Um, so you're, we're talking about like A-levels in England or higher as in Scotland. You know what I'm talking about when I talk about specifications for courses. The idea is that we're going to be developing um, a, a kind of curriculum criteria for what it would mean to offer circumpolar studies, um, either as a sort of single courses or as a, um, a some an add-on to um, 
degree courses that already exist or as a whole new degree course. But the idea is that we want to, rather than provide sort of off the shelf courses and say, here's circumpolar studies, we want to be able to um, allow for local flexibility in, in how these courses are taught and what is actually in them, um, whilst still maintaining a shared understanding uh, amongst the UArctic member institutions about what circumpolar studies is, a shared technical vocabulary, a shared, shared perceptions, um, a shared theoretical underpinnings, um, a shared understanding that is represented by the topic specifications without being at all prescriptive about how individual, uh, individual institutions or, or consortia of institutions within the UArctic decide that they want to deliver uh, these courses. So we're going to be interested in different perspectives on circumpolarity, on what it is to be circumpolar. And we're, of course, extremely concerned to make sure that we're involving Arctic voices. Um, the Arctic is a place of uh, home for four million people. Many of them are indigenous uh, peoples who have been, uh, whose ancestors have been living there since time immemorial. And uh, the Arctic is not all the same around the pole. Um, it is polyvocal and multidisciplinary um, and we want to respect that, uh, those kinds of local understandings as much as possible in our development of these curriculum criteria. And we are going to provide um, example courses as well. That's the second part of our plan so that institutions can use them as models or teach them off the shelf. Um, but on, I, I guess, I think for me personally, the most exciting part is that the topic specifications that we're not telling anybody what what these things need to be, but rather than providing resources for people to teach circumpolar studies. And we're going to continue getting faculty together and students together uh, on a regular basis going forward in the future. Faculty who are teaching about the Arctic, about the circumpolar world to share, not their, not research about the circumpolar world, but pedagogical research about how to teach about the circumpolar world, best practice, um, and the local insights that are coming out of um, their particular adaptations of circumpolar studies. And we don't want it just to be faculty, we also want it to involve students. These are, these are courses for, or, or modules for undergraduate students. And undergraduate students often get overlooked and we'd like to, them to be able to come together to share their research, to share their um, experience of doing circumpolar studies and to collaborate on joint activities. And so we just launched in September of last year. Um, we, uh, we had meant to, be it a few other things, but COVID has made that um, difficult. Uh, we have a, an online workshop. Our first online workshop is scheduled to take place on the 12th of March. And if anybody's interested in that, please email me. My email's at the bottom. Um, the, this first, first workshop on circumpolar studies is meant to um, gather uh, views from around the circumpolar world from faculty about, about what teaching and learning circumpolar studies is all about. And again, um, I wanted to stress this, this separate slide on the students. Um, UArctic has done a number of student related activities. I mean, not only including the North to North Mobility Program, which allows students to do exchanges between UArctic member institutions, but also special programs, some of these you see photographs of. Um, we're going to continue doing these sorts of, we'd like to add to this by doing our own undergraduate symposia. And uh, like I said, students will be invited there to present their own views, but also to take in, in part in some unique learning experiences. For example, the experiential learning of Model Arctic Council, um, which is an opportunity for students to play the roles of diplomats at a real meeting of the Arctic Council, essentially putting on the mantle of these diplomats and working out uh, a political declaration on, a, on, a, on a, an issue that the Arctic faces that's on the Arctic Council's agenda uh, for themselves, learn about the Arctic, learn about uh, negotiation, persuasion, consensus building, um, and, and be inspired. Um, Model Arctic Council is something that the EU Arctic is involved in. Um, it's also something that I personally am involved in, uh, separate to Lyra Institute. And, and Liz mentioned that there, she, she thought there'd be some interest to talk about that. So I'm, I'm quite happy to talk about uh, Model Arctic Council with anyone. And since we are, we're, we're here only um, virtually, I thought it might be worthwhile um, just introducing myself because we can't get together for coffee afterwards. This is me. Um, I, I'm, I'm an adjunct at Trent University uh, and I help run the Lyra Institute. Um, I'm, I'm here in the UK, um, though I am Canadian, and I do like getting up to Scotland. I'm a real Scotophile, so um, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet in person one day. 
like I mentioned, I, I do run, um, uh, separate to the Lyra Institute, I run um, model Arctic Council events and, and my re research interests are um, Arctic education, Arctic governance, and because actually my PhD is in philosophy, I'm interested in Arctic philosophy as well. Okay, so I hope we do get a chance to meet one day and that this all comes to an end, but that's all I've got. And so I really thank you for your time listening to that. You can, you can contact me here at uh, my coordinates that are on the screen. And if you're interested in more information about the Lyra Institute and the work that we're doing, and you or your institution would like to get involved in it, this is really a, a um, you know, around the pole kind of uh, effort. That's our uh, website. At the moment, we're, we're new, so we don't have a, a website of our own yet, but you can look us up on the UArctic website there on that website. And I'd be very, very pleased to hear from anyone who wants to learn more about our work or, or um, get involved. So thank you. Sorry, I probably thought I'm muting. Thank, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, so we, we've now heard from four different people um, discussing, I think, a kind of fairly broad range of how we see environmental education within the con this broader context context of a Scottish Arctic network um, and I think it was interesting Anthony what you were saying about the the sort of core of the Arctic being the the polar core and then there's 34 other institutions um, and, you know, th those of us working in Scotland and, and the rest of the UK um, have been have been able to partner and I think it's certainly working in the northeast of Scotland particularly I think it, it's a tremendous opportunity to look north as well as other places globally and I think to understand our place within that North Atlantic and, and further north context is really really important in understanding issues that are similar and different and I was very struck actually just to say although Anthony you're now based, based a Canadian based here that you know a lot of the issues arising from post oil well hopefully post oil but a lot of the issues that have arisen from living in oil economies are shared across um, the northern parts of the world. So be it where Donald and I are here in Aberdeen, we're a kind of decaying oil city now. Um, we share many of the same social economic issues um, and, and in terms of climate justice um, that you'll find at, at different levels you know, in northern Canada and, and, nor and North North America. So I think I think it is an important thing to realise the connections and when Donald was talking about um, how in Scotland the learning for sustainability is now embedded in policy both in terms of what children should be able to access in school but I think from the point of view of um, the teaching profession we still have a teaching council unlike our counterparts south of, south of the border um, and it's a key element now of becoming a, a teacher that, you know, to be a professional teacher, you need to be able to show commitment and practice in relation to sustainability and, and, and issues around that. And I think the, the two speakers in the middle, I think, again, give really powerful examples of how in higher education, just as in school education, learning directly from the context in which you might then be working in the future and being able to talk to people from a range of different cultural backgrounds and different disciplines, how important that is in understanding the key issues around envir environmental education, that it's not about siloed approaches, it's actually about the interconnectedness between um, different ways of thinking, um, practical problems and how you might might solve those problems, but even even changing the questions that we ask about the relationship between people and the land and, and the, the places in which we inhabit. 